In that first room, a conservation room, I watched a woman seated beside an ironing board, sewing intently. She was working on a damaged blue and white stripe prisoner uniform. Of course, I had never been this close to one of these iconic garments. I thought about the uniform I had seen, the uniforms I had seen on display and those I had seen in photographs. This jacket was much more elaborate than any I had ever seen. It was carefully tailored with many seams and pockets, but it was also in terrible shape. There were huge holes and tears in it. Uh, why is that word the same as tears? These wounds were the focus of the seamstress's careful attention. The room was electric with the energy that crackled from this fragile object, and I was deeply affected by the experience. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of the Forum. This evening, we excitedly start week one of a three-week storytelling series, Beyond Borders, Women's Stories, and the Art of Bearing Witness. This October, we will welcome four fascinating women storytellers, who I know will captivate you as they share their work which bears witness to struggles about human rights, memory, belonging, and love. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Laura Levitt upon the publication of her new book, Objects That Remain. I'd like to thank Dr. Levitt, who will be introduced in a moment for participating in this evening's program. We are most grateful to you for sharing your story. It is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, Dr. Barbara Abrams, Associate Professor, World Languages and Cultural Studies Department and Director of the Global and Cultural Studies Program at Suffolk University. Her work focuses on global and cultural studies, French literature of the Enlightenment, and women's and gender studies. Her most recent work includes an archival research project titled Resisters, which examines women cloistered against their will in the 18th century France. Barbara, it, turn it over to you. I first met Laura in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the cafeteria at the Hebrew, Hebrew Union College many years ago. I used to lunch there often on my break from teaching and studying across the street at the University of Cincinnati. My husband was a rabbinical student at HUC at the time. We got to know each other over our common interests, and you would think the rest was her story. But no, we both went our separate ways, pursuing our doctorates, she at Emory and I at Columbia. We established our careers, and in fact, we lost touch with one another for quite a few years, until one day, a few years ago, my kids introduced me to the miraculous invention of Facebook. I refound Laura and started putting little likes by her personal and work posts. Eventually, the likes grew to hearts, and we ended up texting. After I saw the description of her latest work, The Objects That Remain, on Facebook, there were not enough hearts to say how much I loved this project. Recently, I have been involved in a project of my own, retelling the lives of women in 18th century France who were consigned to the convent against their will. These stories are written in letters to the crimson-robed King Louis XV of France. Even though the focus of our work is centuries and continents apart, I was particularly struck by the similarities of our work. Reading a story that conveys forensic qualities, one considers the historiography, the psychology, and the quality of the testimony and of the narrative. These categories are not separate nor are they mutually exclusive of other types of storytelling, but they become important strategies in the consideration of this genre of narrative. The Objects That Remain is an exercise in what I would call forensic storytelling. Laura Levitt's memoir is an exploration of the ways in which the material remains of violent crimes inform our thinking about trauma and loss. Forensic storytelling is the act of narrating a story that is carved from real life experience. It is a narrative that expresses the subjective quality of truth as related from the perspective of the narrator. 
This type of storytelling is first and foremost the sharing of experiences that are key to survival and the passing of these experiences to other people and consequently to further generations. Laura's work moves from an examination of the artifacts of genocide in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and evidence in police storage facilities across the country to her own story of intimate trauma and unsolved rape. She asks what it might mean to do justice to these violent pasts outside the justice system or through historical accounts. This type of narrative is so relevant in the field of women's studies and is an, an essential part of our narrative. I texted Laura and I told her I had to get her to come to Suffolk to talk about her new book and voila, here she is. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to my old friend and new colleague, Laura Levitt. Laura is professor of religion, Jewish studies and gender at Temple University, where she has chaired the religion department and directed both the Jewish studies and the gender and sexuality and women's studies programs. She is author of The Objects That Remain, American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust, Jews and Feminism, The Ambivalent Search for Home, Impossible Images, Contemporary Art After the Holocaust and Judaism Since Gender, and an editor with Tracy Fessenden and David Harrington Watt of New York University Press's North American Religious Series. She is working on a series of new uh, books and I welcome Laura to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's really an honor to be here. And um, this is the first book talk that I've given and the book is about to emerge and I should be getting my copy in the next week. So I am so grateful to all of the people who put this program together. And I wanted to begin by doing a reading from the introduction of the book to give you all a feel for what the book does. And um, uh, I will begin at the beginning. It was early August when I took the metro out to a suburban station to meet the chief conservator of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She was taking me to the museum's offsite storage facility. I would spend the day in this most unlikely place. As I entered the nondescript suburban building, the museum's offsite repository had not yet moved to its new state of the art facility. I was struck by its bland character, a deliberate choice. This was my impression until I entered the first of many rooms and eventually the vast storage space that houses so much of the museum's collection. In that first room, a conservation room, I watched a woman seated beside an ironing board, sewing intently. She was working on a damaged blue and white striped prisoner uniform. Of course, I had never been this close to one of these iconic garments. I thought about the uniform I had seen, the uniforms I had seen on display and those I had seen in photographs. This jacket was much more elaborate than any I had ever seen. It was carefully tailored with many seams and pockets, but it was also in terrible shape. There were huge holes and tears in it. Uh, why is that word the same as tears? These wounds were the focus of the seamstress's careful attention. The room was electric with the energy that crackled from this fragile object, and I was deeply affected by the experience. I find myself honing in to consider clothing and other material objects as intimate objects. These are objects that cover and hold our bodies. We wear these textiles, we live inside of them. The longer we inhabit them, the more of us they contain. As Maggie Nelson suggests, millions of traces of our DNA in skin cells, sweat, piss, blood, saliva, tears, permeate such garments. But clothing that is worn day in and day out for long periods of time is also marked in a different way. It is shaped by the bodies, by our bodies. Not only were these uniforms worn constantly, but because they were handed out haphazardly, they often did not fit and so were carefully tailored by the very prisoners who wore them, who used whatever was at hand to try to make them fit. The uniform jacket I saw being mended was unusual in its intricate tailoring. It was altered to fit a specific person. 
the camp uniform held the camp uniforms held in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum collection are so fragile that careful efforts must be made simply to keep them from disintegrating. And because the bodies of those who inhabited these garments have been missing for so long, in order to preserve them, to keep them from falling apart, each uniform has its own body shaped hanger. These effigies are custom fit. They are specially made for each jacket, shirt, or pair of pants. These stuffed mannequin like hanging figures help take the stress off of fragile seams and frayed panels. The prisoners are gone, but the hangers convey a semblance of their presence. In reverse logic, the bodies beneath the fabric protect the garment, not the other way around. Because these pieces of clothing are also witnesses to the atrocities performed on those who wore them, they attest to those crimes. They constitute a form of criminal as well as historical evidence. Bound to those bodies and those legacies, they offer silent testimony, but their presence in the museum is not simply material. An aura emanates from these intimate articles of clothing. Once an abiding presence in the lives of those who wore them, these garments carry the traces of those now absent bodies. Such haptic connections are what attracts us or attracts us to these tainted pieces of clothing. Not unlike religious relics, whose proximity to the bodies of saints and martyrs make them holy, these garments hold and embody the horrors they witnessed and the memory of the lives lost. They transmit a semblance of what happened to the now ghostly figures whose shapes come back to us in the form of hanging effigies. These modern relics carry a kind of living presence. They hold traces of the blood, the sweat, the tears of those whose lives were brutally violated. They continue to bristle with meaning. The sacred status of these pieces of clothing is bound up in visceral bodily connections similar to those that inherit in other sacred objects, such as the contact relic, the cloth that touched the martyr, the clothing that revered figures wore when they were tortured or killed. And although this notion of the relic is bound to a profoundly Christian legacy of reverence for objects, its allure is more pervasive. In part, my book is about the lingering afterlives of Christian notions of the sanctity of such objects. The story before you is about trauma and loss and how material objects embody such suffering. It is also a tale of life after such violence and the things, the artifacts and the places that make them manifest. Such objects keep the event tangible, suspended and within our reach. This resonance between artifacts and their power to witness to the crimes against humanity, against individuals and their ability to make holy the profane is at the essence of this book. Atlanta, November, 1989. Early in the evening of the first Tuesday in November, 1989, I was raped in my home in Atlanta, Georgia. As it turned out, this happened just as the Berlin Wall was about to fall. A strange man broke into my home, hid, and then attacked me. I screamed and this only exacerbated his rage. He choked me and then he raped me in my own bed. He threatened to kill me. At the time, I was a graduate student at Emory completing my doctoral studies in religion. After the police finally arrived on the scene, itself a protracted and exasperating experience, they began to ask questions and collect evidence. But I need to say that the police came late, too late to apprehend the suspect. Not only had I waited on hold with 911 until I finally got through to the police, but I later learned that my landlady, having heard my cries, had also called the police to no avail. She too could not get through to report the crime and process. This is a gap in time I still cannot fully fathom. By the time the police arrived, the man was long gone. Before I was taken to Grady Hospital, a large urban public institution, the only hospital in the vicinity equipped to deal with rape, and I should add the only hospital in the region with an AIDS clinic, I remember the police in my apartment. I was taken to Grady for a rape exam only after the Atlanta police had combed the scene for evidence. They took the comforter and some of the sheets that had been on my bed and after the rape exam at the hospital, I believe they also took possession of various pieces of my clothing, including my sweatpants and my underwear. But here my memory falters. I hardly remember the order of these events or what the police took. 
What I do know is that once they left, I threw away the rest of the clothing I had been wearing. I placed these items in a dumpster. I think it was outside of the hospital. At least that's how I remember it. Although none of these items appear in any police documents, none of my, position, my possessions are listed, for example, in the inventory from the crime scene um, on the official report. I only received a copy of this report in the fall of 2014 after I filed a request for information with the Atlanta police about my case and my evidence. To date, nothing has been found, neither the evidence procured from my rape kit, nor any of the clothing or bedding taken from my home and my person that night. These items no longer appear to be accessible. I do not know what happened to any of them, nor do I know whether my rape kit was ever processed. That information cannot be verified. I can only assume that it was not. Nevertheless, even as I've learned about these possessions, that I, even as I have learned that these possessions are no longer accessible, I am moved by my memory, by the imprint of these once tactile everyday objects on how I think about this past and the fact that I have for so many years forgotten all about them. Clothing taken, relics, bloody garments, handmade earthenware bowls, loving gifts, and the places where they were given, a first floor apartment, a renovated house, city streets in a once divided landscape, matter. Held in such material containers, the trauma is made concrete. These tangible objects testify to the fact that these events are not a figment of the imagination. They are one important way we know that these events actually happened, that this is not a dream. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I have to take a minute to breathe. Laura, when you say that violence and trauma pierce the consciousness, I'm so struck by an opposite feeling that I have within me. When I read your narrative, and the quality of empathy that comes forth, as you put it, a surprise of tenderness. I feel that this is a purposeful narrative and that it really gives us permission and people who have suffered from trauma, anybody, to meet you and themselves in a place that is otherwise so hard to access. I know we've had this conversation before, um, but I'd like to let you tell the um, audience a little bit more about this phenomenon of emotional access. Um, thank you, Barbara. And I, again, I am so honored to be here and to be able to share my work. Um, um, I think that um, one of the things, one of the, one of the things that really moved me to write this book is how I found comfort in the voices and the writing and the artwork of other people. And um, one of the things that I think is really, really difficult for people who have experienced various kinds of violence and trauma is that it's really lonely. It's a lonely place to be. And, um, and, some, and, and, and it's also shattering so that the kind of um, stories that we tell ourselves to make things feel okay, to make us feel like we're, the world is all right, that we can keep going, all of that really changes quite radically when you've experienced um, the floor cave in, right? And um, I think that to find other people who are able to express some of what that feels like makes you feel one, like you're not crazy, and two, that you're not in this alone. And so in many ways, my book is a real, um, um, it's, it pays tribute to the people, the, the writers and artists whose work really were there for me and that have helped me figure out how to tell my story in a way that's generative and in a way that um, does justice to the complicated narrative that it is. And, um, and I think that that's really what storytelling is all about. And so for me, doing justice is about being able to share stories. Um, it's, it's to make sure that 
someone else who experiences something like this, like what I experience, won't feel as alone that, as I did, and that, um, that they'll know it's all right for them to tell their stories as well. Yeah. And I feel like that's the kind of intimacy that Svetlana Baum writes about um, as diasporic intimacy. And she says, it happens after you've lost everything and then you're surprised. You're surprised that there are these lovely moments of tenderness, of engagement, even sometimes with strangers, right? Um, and I want to, I want to validate and um, value and um, give voice to some of what that experience is. So much of the ways in which we talk about trauma and violence in this culture is so tied to the legal system. And that, you know, it's, it's exacerbated by television, dramas, um, everything gets resolved in the courtroom and courtrooms don't really work that way for most of us. The vast majority of people who have been raped um, never have their cases go to court, much less have, you know, anybody kind of work on the case. And so to be able to take charge and to be able to say, you know, there's something else I can do here that might actually help somebody else. And um, I think I started writing about my story early on because I had studied feminist theory and I had learned how to use my first person voice. And um, that was a gift. It was a gift because I knew that I could do this. Yeah. That it would have an audience. That, that really um, leads me to, to the next question, actually. Um, as uh, I, I want to tell the um, listeners that we have had um, classes at Suffolk University read parts of your book. And in my um, global and cultural studies class, we uh, talked about uh, parts of your book. And we have some students coming on later in the um, evening to talk directly to you. But it seemed um, to be a really prevalent question, so I'm going to ask it now because it's very connected um, to what you're saying. Um, Carla Rodriguez, whom you'll meet later, um, asked the question, um, do you have advice for anyone who has been through a sexual trauma and wants to share their story but doesn't have any access to material or forensic evidence? What would you do? And what would you advise, advise this person to do? Absolutely. Well, let me just say, I have no access to anything from my case. I, I got the case file and that was almost um, a good, mm, about seven years into the project um, and almost 30 years after I had been raped um, that I finally got through and actually was able to get a copy of the, um, the report. And um, I, can't have access to my material objects, um, to the, any of the evidence that was taken. But I do have my memory of those things. And I would say to whoever this is, and I actually have this fantasy of a project um, that I would say, I want to figure out how to do, which is um, I'd like to imagine a kind of online space where um, people who've experienced violent crimes, um, whether that's to a loved one or themselves, um, could use the, their imagination of objects connected to those crimes to tell those stories. And I really like to sort of see that it, it would be akin to what they have at the Holocaust Museum, which is this um, curator's corner where people tell stories about particular objects. And I love that. And I just think that I, my imagination is that for, for some of your students, I bet, who are really great at um, um, word, word um, at, at poetry slams and those kinds of things that they may be able to, 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 to perform something in words or someone might be a graphic artist or someone might be really good with video. I want to sort of, I, I imagine it as multimedia where people could, you know, focus on an object that was there at that time and that place as a way of exploring that memory and sharing a story with others. And um, so I have it as a kind of the evidence corner and mm. I haven't figured out quite how to do it yet, but that is one of the things that is on my agenda. So it's like recreating the evidence through a, a narrative or some artistic medium. Great, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have one last comment question 
response um, before we go back to another reading. Um, when you write, the story before you is about trauma and loss and how material objects embody such suffering. I'm struck how you describe the object as something that's, that's powerful, that's able to hold the tragedy itself and that material objects embody suffering. It seems more powerful than even the tool of memory itself, an aide memoir or a transitional object since it embodies the tragedy. I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on this idea of embodiment um, and how the actual artifact is able to tell a story. And I'm concerned too about the power of the object because do we not have the agency to give that object the power? And how do we take it back if it has too much power? Yeah, well, this is this question in, in kind of in critical theory about um, animate objects, and there's a lot of debate about this question. And I come out of religious studies, and I, um, I'm really grateful to the work of um, a wonderful scholar who works on um, uh, religious practices in Mexico. And she really talks about how um, objects become animate through our tender care and, and engagement with them. So the rituals of holding um, and caring for and caressing um, a, a, a sacred object is what makes them sacred. So it's not like the objects just, you know, have this power. We, it, this is a relationship. And so it, it ha we, we have to give them voice. So even the term forensic, um, so some of your students might um, have been engaged in forensics, um, which was not um, working in a lab um, in a white coat, but, um, but performing orally, right, um, in competitions. And so forensics itself kind of holds that, that tension right inside the word. So we need to give voice to those objects. Um, and part of what I love about having an archive or a collection like the Holocaust Memorial Museum's collection um, is that um, artists and writers and scholars and journalists and poets of all kinds can go to the museum and work with material there to breathe life into them. And it's not as if one person tells the story and that's it. It doesn't work that way. What animates the object is the telling of many stories. So my take is one take, your take would be another take, your student's take is another. And it's the sort of movement, the breathing movement of those multiple stories that is animation literally, right? It is a kind of movement between these different stories. And if you stop at any one of them, right, you kill it. You, 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 you put that, it's like the butterfly that, um, uh, that Virginia Woolf talks about where it's no longer alive because it's pinned to the to the to that that um, surface um, but we want it to flutter and so we breathe life into it we give our words we 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 we're the ones who do that animating and we'd also do that again in the other parts of the book I talk about this as the as holding and the work of conservation which I've talked about here and also custody, which is what the police do with um, material objects in their, um, in their uh, hold. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am also interested to ask about um, some of the, the first chapter in your book where you talk about medieval Jewish history and reliquaries and the color red. Um, do you think that there is a significance to using things like um, color? Is there a universal with this, with the color red? Because it seemed to be a pervasive theme. Um, well, well, Maggie Nelson's book is called The Red Parts, and um, it is a very evocative title that both is about viscera, um, blood and guts, but it's also very much comes from the realm of um, a certain kind of printing practices in New Testament scholarship, so that the words of Jesus are the red parts of the Bible. And there are many, maybe some of your students come from communities that use the red letter Bibles. And so in those red letter Bibles, the words of Jesus are, in, are printed in red. Mm. Um, and so 
I think that red means different things. I'm not sure about universal because I think when you get married, for example, in China, you wear a red dress and not a white dress um, or in other places. So I can't speak to outside of the European imagination, but where you work, and I loved hearing that um, uh, about more about your um, work and the, the red robes. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that in legal text, often the sort of framing devices in those texts, the important kind of things are also pr printed in red. Mm -hmm. um, but red does come with that sense of blood um, and it's there. And in particular in the works that I look at in that um, medieval interlude is um, there is this um, trope, um, a kind of figure in um, medieval Jewish, European Jewish poetry that um, that really was a response to the Crusades in particular and all of the sort of um, bloody, very terrible things that happened to Jewish communities. Um, and uh, they refer to biblical texts about the, the Porphyrion of God, the royal robe of God, um, covered with the blood of Jewish martyrs, literally covered in blood. And so the red is very much about blood. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and their argument and the way I got interested in this is that somehow that um, textile, the robe of God, covered with the blood of Jewish martyrs would somehow act as a kind of archive that could be read maybe by a forensic reader um, and justice could be done. Now, I, as someone who works in contemporary and 20th century American Jewish and sort of Holocaust memory, um, uh, there's always a way in which, you know, I, I, in Jewish studies, one should have some kind of a text that's not modern, um, some kind of, you know, authoritative text. And so I got very excited about um, this figure and I did a lot of work to kind of figure out how this worked, how, the, how those uh, medieval European Jewish poets imagined this vision of justice. And I was really excited because I felt this connection to them. And then I also felt, a profound disappointment because for them justice in God's dare I say hands um, would be more violence, more blood that he that their he God would um, somehow avenge all of the deaths of the Jewish martyrs and all the people who had um, harmed Jews would also be harmed. And honestly, I had to say that's not what I'm after. And so the interlude was to sort of complicate what we mean when we think about justice. And does it always have to come from on high, either from God or from the state, um, in the form of retribution and punishment? And um, I'm, I have to say that's not what I'm after. I'm much more interested in finding a way to honor the experiences that I have had and that others have had um, so that we can be acknowledged and see each other and live our lives, not denying what happened to us, but in recognition of those memories. And for me, that's the thing, that's what justice is about. Thank you. Can you read us some more from your book? Okay, so I'm gonna read you just a little bit more um, right now from the end of the introduction, um, just to give you a little bit of a taste of kind of where I go. So. So I start out here, but there is more to the presence of these material artifacts. They not only provide a sense of continuity, offering us tangible proof that we are the same people we were before, they also allow us to make connections to others. And this is what we've been really talking about here. Through these often ordinary articles, we connect to other people, especially those who also live their lives after violence, trauma, and profound loss. The intimacy that literary scholar Svetlana Baum writes about is often occasioned by material objects and places. The shards of life in the former Eastern Europe, later found in Berlin flea markets or echoed in the exhibition of small ephemera, ephemeral objects found in the stomach of a once beloved walrus in the Berlin Zoo. This is diasporic intimacy or in a different but perhaps related way, these insights tell us something about precious and precarious objects like the striped prisoner uniform held at the museum in Washington. They provide continuity between then and now, the past and its futures. They also allow us to engage with others, 
They invite, as I, we've been saying, conversation. Objects facilitate human interaction. Tainted artifacts are oddly compelling. They demand our attention. Like Roland Barthes punctum, they bristle with life. As witnesses to crimes, both large and small, they embody a kind of agency. Their vibrancy is bound to the type of promises I'm describing here. They help us continue to tell stories and engage with one another. And in these ways, they help us remember past, remember past even as they enable us to shape different futures. Objects in this sense, traces of past harms, bridge time and space, connecting past to present, before to after. Their palpable presence then and there, but also here and now, matters. They continue, albeit fragile, their continued, albeit fragile existence in the present interrupts the dreaminess, the frightening, alluring, and untenable notion that life after is after life itself. They remind us that we did not die. And the tasks before us are not only about death, but also about living on. They point to our ongoing existence. And this is how I have come to experience and understand these things. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of, um, from this part that's called the, a note on method. So my book is a meditation on the allure of once ordinary artifacts that were brushed by violence, on where they take us and how they become animate. The rites and rituals around them, the arts of holding that transform them into sacred objects through our tender care. And that's that relationship Barbara and I were talking about. This is not history. The book operates on an associative logic. It offers an idiosyncratic take, a meditation on why we are drawn to particular texts, objects, and practices, and how they become meaningful. The book explores these acts of commemoration as ongoing practices and shows how they work. And I use the phrase, not unlike, and others similar to it, to draw attention to significant juxtapositions of objects, problems, phenomena, and experience that are often not put next to one another and whose likeness may thus at first seem unlikely and may even invoke resistance. Unlike a scientist or a historian who makes arguments about what objects, problems, events, and experience fit into specific categories and why, my task is more akin to a process of clearing away the frames that might keep a viewer from seeing the connections among unlikely juxtapositions of objects, problems, phenomena, and experiences, with the result that each one may better enhance our understanding of the others. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Um, your work is a dialogue, and I invite dialogue. I'd like to encourage people to type into the Q&A so that we can continue this conversation before we go on to um, a dialogue with um, the listeners, I'd like to invite my students to come and ask some questions because we have been working on your piece. And um, I'm gonna let my students introduce themselves, but these are students from Suffolk University's Global and Cultural Studies program. They are in my class reading all different types of narratives from around the world. And we were lucky enough to get to read your work. So we're gonna begin now. Um, if Isabel won't uh, mind introducing herself and then we'll go down the list. So go Absolutely. ahead, Isabel. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Isabel Lundquist. I am a freshman at Suffolk University. I'm a global cultural studies major. Um, thank you for telling your story. Um, it's been wonderful. Um, my question for you is, in relating your story to major historical events where trauma presents itself, you identify that objects hold a primal relationship between recollection and emotion. What is it exactly about reliving trauma through objects that allows for the healing process, both for you specifically and within your studies about mass and historic tragedy? Thank you, Isabel. That is a really sophisticated and difficult question. And I really appreciate the care with which you've really thought this through. So um, I think that um, in part, um, one of the things that I think is so interesting about objects is that um, when we think about Holocaust memory in particular, we're at a sort of juncture historically where survivors um, are getting very old and are very frail and many of them are dying. And I'm struck by the fact that in this moment, we are really witnessing all of us 
how something that began as memory is becoming increasingly history, right, in, before our eyes. And I think that it's telling that many um, novelists, contemporary novelists, who are now writing about the Holocaust are doing so using objects. Because part of what makes objects powerful is that they were there in that place, in that time with those people. So that jacket was on the body of a person who was in a camp. And they carry the traces of some of that. And so they help us remember that it isn't an abstraction, right? And that this isn't about six million, but this is about people who wore an object like that jacket. And this is part of the way we begin to move from um, memory into history and remind ourselves constantly of the sort of materiality. This is why historical sites are so important, right? We go, you, you all are in Boston and there are all, I live in Philadelphia. There are all kinds of historical sites all around us that remind us of history. So when we look at George Washington's house on um, uh, Independence Mall here in Philadelphia, recently in the last 10, 15 years, when they re-excavated, they discovered the slave quarters and we were able to, to see, and now people who go and visit there are reminded and become more um, attuned to that history and the people who lived it because we are able to touch something of their lives, the shards of their lives. So that's part of how this works kind of in the broad sense. In my own story, like I said, I don't really have the physical objects per, from my case, right? Um, I have a photograph, which you all were able to see in the chapter that you read, of my sweatpants um, in, that, in that report. But, I, but as I wrote about it, and this was just the case, I was so unnerved by that report that it took me almost two years holding the report in my custody, so to speak, um, before I could even see that that picture was in the file because there were other pictures in that file and my words in that file that, I, that were so um, disturbing to me um, that I just didn't see it, even though that's what I had been looking for. Um, so um, I think that these can be touchstones um, that remind us that it really happened. And I think that notion of a figment of our imaginations, sometimes the things that happen are so unbelievable to us, to the people who experience it. How could this have happened to me? And to know that, oh, that object was there. It wasn't just me. Um, and I have just read a fantastic book by um, a wonderful woman who wrote a book called um, Is Rape a Crime? And in, that, in this book, a beautiful, powerful book, there's a moment where she says, all she has is a bloody sheet. And it was the sheet that was there with her that she found herself on when she thought her life might have ended. And even 30 years later, that sheet speaks to her, reminding her of what happened. And it was a witness, so she wasn't alone. And I do tend to personify ob uh, objects in a certain way in my own life, um, particularly clothing. Um, that's how the beginning of the very, very beginning of the book starts. Um, and that is peculiar to me. And I guess I just do want to say one other thing. I don't think that all people who experience trauma find objects meaningful. Um, I can't speak to all of them. This is the idiosyncratic sort of um, approach that I take and that really spoke to me. But I think other things may move other people in different ways and I want to honor that. And I certainly do not want to tell anyone how best they should engage or remember their experience they are the keeper of those experiences and I am just not in a position to tell them that. Thank you, thank you again. I feel like I have to take a breath in between <laughs> each comment. It's, it's really uh, heavy and uh, meaningful, very powerful. Um, our next student, uh, Carla, would you introduce yourself please? Hello, my name is Carla Rodriguez Paz. I'm a sophomore at Suffolk University and I'm a psychology major. Um, before I ask my question to you, Professor Levitt, 
I just want to thank you in advance for sharing your story as that's not something easy to do. Um, my question for you is, how did your background in your studies help you look back on your traumatic experience and help you to cope with it? Thank you. Um, thank you, Carla, and I really appreciate um, your kind words and um, your eloquent question. Um, as I said earlier in my conversation with Barbara, I think having worked in feminist theory um, in women's studies, I have a certificate, an under, a graduate certificate in women's studies, that's what it was called then. And um, I think that reading first person writing by people like Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich and Minnie Bruce Pratt and the beautiful poet Rena Klepfish um, and Melly K. Kantowitz, um, in these, those two in the kind of Jewish mode of a kind of identity politics. They taught me that beautiful first person writing is powerful and meaningful and open to so many of us. Um, so I think that's one of the places where I would begin. Um, and I also wanna say that I think when I was growing up, the idea that something terrible would happen to you and I would be tainted, that my body would be tainted, I think might have been unbearable for me as, um, as, a, as a high school student, for example, and maybe even as an undergraduate. And it wasn't until I really went to graduate school and studied feminist theory that I think I was able to do that. And I also want to say, I'm glad you're studying psychology. I will say that having really, really good therapists um, for a very long time in one's life is also a gift to be able to have, um, a privilege to have, and a life-saving thing. So for me, those things were really important. But the other thing that came out in the working out of this book is that, and in the chapter that, you, one of the chapters that you all read in the class, is that um, this experience really shook my um, faith. Um, and I had been studying theology, and I don't really do theology. Um, uh, I wasn't looking to talk about God. Um, and after this happened, my work changed radically. I don't and part of what I lost is I don't know what kind of a scholar I would have been had this not happened to me when it happened to me. And that's something I will just never know. I wrote about my rape in my first book. I've written about it here. I live with this because, you know, we keep telling those stories. That's how, that's how that animating process works. And, um, and I will say that in the process of writing this book, I've come to a different kind of religious engagement and the objects were a way for me to be able to have that. So I'm very grateful to the work on material religion um, that has really helped me kind of think about those, these kinds of issues in ways that were so radically different from my training as a graduate student in religious studies studying theology. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to Mia, our next student. Without the relics to tell your story and without the proper justice or a conclusion, how do you move on from a traumatic experience? Which I mean really is, um, how do you live with it? This is a, Nia, thank you so much. I'm sorry, there's, um, an, I just wanna make sure my audio was on as well. Um, so again, as I sort of said, to Barbara, I think, you know, I don't have my objects, so I have my memory of the objects. And that's one of the ways in which we can begin to do that first part of your question. But your real question, I think, is about living on. And um, I think one of the things that I want to say, um, and one of the things that I wrote about in the introduction that you all read, some the students read, is that um, part of what I talk about is um, my life was threatened and I thought I was going to die. And um, having not died, having been able to live, was itself a really powerful, euphoric, um, driving force in my life. I think I was a little, I think I was a little manic for about 20 years. Um, because when I thought I might die, I was still in graduate school and I had just kind of begun to find my kind of, my voice and what I love to do. And I thought, oh my God, if, if you know, if I can't die, I just, I just got started. I have all these things I want to do. Um, and I really wanted to be a scholar and a teacher and I wanted to write and I got to do it. And it was so amazing to me. And that was sort of like, that was after kind of the nightmare of waking up and I was still, I couldn't get out of the nightmare. But after that, 
it was that kind of, for me, it, there was a strange euphoria that really lasted a very, very long time. And it drove me to kind of do all the things that I, I really wanted to do. Um, I think other people experience that in many different ways. That book that I just referenced, this is an amazing woman who works at um, Tufts University and is an advocate for um, sexual assault survivors and has been a part of national conversations. Um, and, you know, I just think, wow, that is just amazing work. I think many people do extraordinary things and we don't hear enough of their stories. Um, and so I really wanted this not to be about, you know, I, I wanted it to be about living after. And I do think there is a great deal of joy in this book, aside from all the stuff that's really hard. I hope that helps. Yes, I, I have to um, agree that there's a lot of tenderness and there is a lot of joy. You, you really get the sense that um, trauma, it, it becomes part of you. It's not a part that you can deny, but you can live with it and it can actually turn into a force that, that drives you. So um, that's, that's very, very clear. Um, I think we'll move on to the last student question and I hope people will still write into the Q&A because we have some time for questions after this. Um, Moritz, would you please introduce yourself for the last student question? Uh, good evening, my name is Moritz Schuster. I'm a senior at Suffolk University, finishing up my sociology major. Uh, and my group wanted to ask you, what can you tell us about the police methodology in general and in your particular experience in the investigation of rape in 1989? Um, thank you, Morris. This is a great question and um, I'm really delighted. I have a whole chapter um, about police property management and um, it's something that I care a lot about. I became a member of a, an, an international organization of police property managers, which is mostly cops um, who do this work, um, the tedious work of um, holding all that evidence. And um, so, but I wanna kind of come to your, your particular question. So the thing that's changed the most is DNA. So I was raped in November of 1989. And I don't know that you all know this, but you might've watched the TV special. Um, the, 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 there were two of them about OJ Simpson. And that OJ Simpson case was kind of the beginning of you know, public acknowledgement of this changes in DNA. And so um, in 1989, there was just not a lot of DNA. And I can just tell you, there were no computers at the um, police precinct in downtown uh, Atlanta when I went in to give my, my, my statement, my victim statement. Someone sat at a, a typewriter and typed it. And then in the report is that typed report with my handwritten um, edits of that statement. That's not how they do it anymore. What they do continue to do is something that um, the artist, um, Elise, Eliza Schwartz, um, in her work Anthem, really asks us to consider. And some of you may know um, some about this, but what is a rape kit and how does it work? And what Eliza, um, what Eliza Schwartz did in Anthem is she tried to collect the rape kits, the sort of physical kits from as many states in the United States as she could get her hands on. And she um, displays them for us to reconsider how these um, kits configure the body of those who are harmed. And uh, it is a very, very powerful piece. And this is a, a close up of one of those, um, one of those kits. The thing that's terrible about the kits that's the same as it was unfortunately in 1989 as it is today is that there are vast numbers of unsolved rapes out there in the world. There are rape kits, thousands and thousands of rape kits in various police precincts across the United States that have yet to be tested. And that work continues. And strangely, one of the biggest advocates for getting attention to this question is the star of the TV show 
special victims unit. This is how pathetic the public um, discourse is on this, that we have to have an actress raise private funds to make sure that these very intricate exams, these very invasive procedures are not done in vain, that they are tested so that we know if there are serial rapists, for example, if we actually had a database that actually had those reports in them. And so that is one of the things that you can hear it in my voice. I'm a little angry. I'm, I am angry about that um, because I think it, it could have prevented so much more suffering. I'm sure that the man who raped me had raped other people and probably continued to do so. And that is the thing that hurt, hurts me the most. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Well, um, I have um, received a number of questions. If you uh, want to answer some more questions, and um, we have the energy and, and time. So um, my first question was um, emailed earlier from Yumalani Malaba Adebo, who asks, I'm wondering what one has to do to get permission to see artifacts in police storage in order to bear witness. Um, would you be able to answer that? Um, as I've said, I think in, that, in order to really talk about most of what's in police storage, most of us have to use acts of imagination to get there. Um, the, the thing that makes the collection at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum so different from the police is that it is an archive and it is open to the public. But because evidence from violent crimes are held in police storage so that they can be secured to someday, hopefully, that's the, that's the promise, um, be called upon to go to court. Even in most cases when they never make it to court. Um, and that means that they are not accessible. I tried to get access to my, my stuff and they couldn't find it. And I'm not sure if they could have actually found it if they would have been able to take pictures of it, but I'm not sure that they would have allowed me to, um, certainly not to touch it because God forbid they needed to use it even 30 years later. And one of the things that I write about in the book is um, in the red parts, um, Maggie Nelson's account of the, tr the belated trial in her aunt's murder, um, she found herself having written a book of poems called Jane a Murder, uh, trying to imagine her aunt's life before and after, a woman she had never met who was, who was murdered before the poet was ever born. Um, she had access to some of her aunt's um, journals, et cetera, and that's what the book of poetry was about. And it was a cold case. It was over 30 years old. And lo and behold, when her book went to press, that first book of poems, there was a break, a DNA match, in that cold case. And when I met the poet Maggie Nelson, um, she had just been to Michigan for the uh, preliminary hearing in what became her aunt's murder trial. And her book, The Red Parts, is about um, that experience, about the trial. And um, let me just be clear, she does, she does not necessarily believe that the courtroom provided justice at all. And in fact, part of what I argue is that her two books do more justice to her aunt's life than anything that ever happened in that courtroom. Nevertheless, when she was in that preliminary hearing for the first time, after having spent years trying to piece together shards of her aunt's life and death, she was confronted by the clothes, and I always kind of do it like this with my hands, the clothes her aunt was wearing the night that she was murdered. And it was hearing that story from Maggie Nelson that set me on this journey. And that reminded me that I had not even thought about my clothes for over 15 years when I first heard that story. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have a question from Susan Flint, who asks, how do we heal and move forward from traumatic events, um, having physical reminders triggering us in all these public places? Yeah, that's a really hard question. And, um, 
again, I can't speak for everyone. And I think many of us have different kinds of trig th our triggers can be many different things for many different people. Um, it could be an angle of someone's jaw. It could be this, a smell. It could be, um, you know, a, a, a kind of something that someone is wearing, um, much less uh, a memorial or a monument or um, a gravesite or any of those things. So triggering is, is difficult. But part of what I'm trying to argue in this book is that engaging with our experiences of trauma and loss and trying to share those stories with people that we think could hear them um, is a way of being less triggered because we have some way of narrating our way out of the that kind of um, liminal state of just being unable to, to speak, which is what trauma does to so many of us. Mm. And so what I think can happen is being able to use what is at hand or in our imagination or a memory um, in order to begin to, to find voice for what we need to say may make it less likely that we will be unnerved because trigger usually in these contexts is, is really you know, a jarring moment as opposed to maybe you know, an, a kind of less um, abrasive um, experience of a kind of flutter of a memory. So this is almost November. It's almost, it's getting dark. It's getting cool outside. And anniversaries are always um, reminders. We are always reminded of this time of year and this space. And so I am struck that my book is coming out mm. in November. Yeah. And that November is the anniversary of my rape. And that's when, and I always experience, for me, election day, all the more <laughs> present, um, as very difficult. Um, it was an off-year election, but this is also off in a different way. Um, and um, I think that rem being able to own some of that and to say it aloud and to remember. And again, I think healing is not a, a teleological narrative where we get to this point and we're good, or we go back to some point. We're all living in this pandemic moment and it's gone on for over six months and it's gonna continue. And when it's over, it's not gonna be back to normal in any simple way. We are all going to carry with us the memory of starting college during a pandemic, launching a book on Zoom during a pandemic. Um, and, and who knows, I put on lipstick today a little bit. I haven't put on lipstick in over six months because I go out into the world with a mask on. Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know, I don't know when I'm not gonna be wearing a mask in public for a very, very long time. And so this is how trauma changes us. We look at the world differently you know, I couldn't believe in the kind of theological vision that I may have had um, when I was in graduate school before this happened to me. And I will never have that again. Yeah. Am I not healthy or healed or what? I, I live on and I'm, I'm a pretty joyous person most of the time, um, but I'm not who I was before. I'm, I am and I'm not. Yeah. And, I, and, and that's the change that happens and we live with that. And it gets reabsorbed in an ever shifting present, as feminist theorists remind us, that we are all multiple selves and we kind of struggle with those things. As we encounter them on the streets of Berlin or Atlanta, I go back, I'm gonna tell you about going back to Atlanta in my last reading, but it's hard. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna take another question. Um, Marley uh, speaks of something that actually uh, is part of the, the whole. When you're, when you're speaking about rape, you know, you also have alluded to this, especially in your last answer, about how this is um, something that speaks to trauma in general. So she asks the question, um, she befriended many Holocaust survivors at a retirement center and heard their stories and asks, what do you think about individuals who have imperfect memory of their experience? And how do we engage with those who have stories to tell, but not, may not be able to fully articulate them in the way that they want to? 
Well, I'd say all of our stories are partial, you know, imperfect. So the story I told or I retell here is different from the story like in the way that I told it 20 years ago when I published my first book or when I wrote six months after I had been raped, an essay about my experience of the silences around rape. Um, I think that I think that memory is um, is 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 living and alive and lively. It's not set in stone. And so I think that some of what we need to begin to remember is that um, the ways we tell stories are always partial. And so one of the beautiful things that many of the um, and it's wonderful that um, Marley, you're able to work with um, survivors still who are able to tell whatever they can tell of their stories. Um, but we now have these, you know, incredible um, video archives. But if you, um, some of the work that some of my, my scholarly friends in, in Holocaust studies are now doing with those video archives um, is really thinking about how um, the different archives, the Shoah Foundation, the Fortunoff Collection at Yale, um, Yad Vashem or the Holocaust Museum in Washington, each of those institutions has a different protocol in terms of how they ask questions and what questions they ask. And what scholars are doing is now looking at, in many instances, the same survivor telling their story in different places. And it's not to say, well, oh, which one's the correct one? They're all correct but to appreciate the ways in which um, different occasions enable different ways of telling our stories and different parts of our stories. So Marley, I think you've been very privileged to have people tell you some of what they can tell you even as they're aging and frail. And um, I, want, I just wanna honor the imperfection of all of our stories. My story is imperfect too. Um, uh, I just think that we have a, a fantasy about like the that story, but there isn't just one. Um, and that's why we need to keep telling and retelling. Thank you, thank you. I think Toni Morrison refers to it as remembery, you know, remembering, putting the members of our memory back together, right? Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to uh, read this. Kelly asks, as you said, the associative connections you make are novel and may invite resistance. Can you talk about your writing process and how you prepared yourself to do this challenging work? Um, thank you, Kelly. That's a, a, a very lovely question. And um, um, I have to say that um, this is maybe where I'm most religious um, in a strange way. Um, I, I, I got onto this project having met Maggie Nelson and heard that story about the clothing and then started to think about my own clothing. And at the time I was writing my last book, which was about, um, Holocaust memory, um, and American Jewish life. And, um, I was interested in photographs. So the photographs at the Holocaust Memorial Museum, the pre-war photographs and, um, and so I was thinking about the stuff in police storage and the stuff in um, uh, in Holocaust collections and like somehow because I was working on that other project when I met Maggie Nelson these two things came together and then of course they came with my own experience and I have to say that for a long time I didn't want the book to be about me and um, I remember I had um, a, a, a colleague a beautiful filmmaker Abraham Rabbit who teaches at um, <laughs> at Hampshire College, he was, writing a, um, he was writing a recommendation for me for a grant and um, he read my proposal and he said, you know, I have to tell you, I, I was with you and then all of a sudden at the very end you talked about your experience and I was like, where did that come from? And so it's taken me a long time. So now that the book starts out and says Laura Levitt was raped, um, that took a long, long time to get there. And so I think the, the process was, I wanted to find out about the police. And I wanted to figure out what's going on with the police and, you know, um, and what is this about custody and how does it work? And so I took a course with the cops. And, um, and so that was some of the beginning and I wanted to figure out the legal stuff. Um, and then I would kind of just kind of, I was following my instinct here. So, you know, something would happen, somebody I'd meet, uh, you know, I'd read something and I was just kind of on the trail. 
And, um, and occasionally, you know, there'd be some weird, um, uncanny moment, like, you know, um, waiting to get Maggie Nelson's book, The Red Parts, um, right when it was published, I pre-ordered it. I had read Jane a Murder, and I was working on this project. It came, I read it, and I knew that she had done, that she had been in one of these 48 hours murder mysteries that she can't stand, but didn't have any control over it. And right after I read her book, I was at a conference and I got back to my hotel room and I turned on the television and I heard Maggie Nelson's voice. And it was that show. And I thought, well, I think I'm on the right trail. So there were these kind of little signs and I, I can't quite explain it, but I had to sort of, sort of trust myself. Um, I hope that, and that's some of the associativeness and, you know, not many people would think about police property management and the cops and the conservators at the Holocaust Museum. But when I first talked to that conservator and told her about my project, she explained to me what the people at the FBI do when they have evidence and how their process is different. And so the fact that she all, that she knew that material because someone close to her had been harmed was both shocking and horrifying. And it was also unbelievable because I just couldn't believe I was in the Holocaust Museum talking to her and she knew about the stuff that the police do. Um, and I found a kindred spirit and I felt very honored by her telling me her story. And this goes back to where we began about the ways in which once we begin to ask and to, to trust that kind of thing, intimacy can happen. We can meet people and be surprised by how much we can connect to each other. Thank you. Um, Laura, I wonder if you would mind uh, taking one more question. I think we can squeeze it in. Um, all right, this is from Mary. Uh, during your career, I'm sure you have encountered students whose academic career was altered because of loss or trauma. I would like you to, uh, to ask you, based on your experience and your subsequent theology work, what you would say to those victimized within academia who then lost um, their lost objects are related to their work and who struggle. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I just, I can't say enough. I mean, we don't talk about rape is a crime. I mean, that's what that book was asking. It's not treated enough as a crime. And the kind of violation that um, those of us in academia, um, because our work is so intimate and so um, absorbing, um, if you're writing a dissertation or a master's thesis, um, or you're working on a book project and something horrible happens, it's very, very difficult to pick up the pieces because, um, because that work is so um, absorbing and so full on. Um, I, think that, I think that one of the things that might be helpful, and I do think ritual is important, I think is to, is to grieve. Um, and to acknowledge those losses. I, I spent a lot of time trying to imagine, like, I, I, like, who would I have been had this not happened to me? What kind of a scholar, my entire career has been shaped by this experience? Who would I have been? What would I have written? I, 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 I can't access that. And so I, I guess I would say to some of the um, students and colleagues, that Mary is talking about, you're gonna to need to grieve what you can't have access to, but also be open to what is before you and what you need to do now in relation to these things that have been so um, profoundly um, um, critical to changing your entire life. And that's the loss that Boim talks about when she talks about only after you've lost everything can you imagine what it means to have tender, to, to find that tenderness, to find that moment of a connection. Because the legal system failed me, right? My theology failed me. Um, I didn't get that kind of justice. Um, and I didn't, I, you know, it was, it was still so startling to me. And so I had to figure out other ways of finding meaning and other ways of making a life. And I hope that in some small measure, I'm sensitive to other people who suffer, particularly students of mine and colleagues of mine, um, because 
that's what I hope my work opens up to them. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have one last reading? All right. This is from the postscript, and um, it is um, it's returning to Atlanta. So um, I'll, I'm going to start kind of in the in the midst of this visit back. As we turned the corner and walked the first block, I didn't know what to expect. It had been about 10 years since I last visited this place. Even then, it looked about the same as I remembered it. More than 15 years ago, I was there with my friend Miriam. We went around the block to see the backyard, carrying a trowel and a packet of seeds, part of a ritual of renewal we planned to undertake. The open yard was untouched. At that time, the screen door and the back porch were exactly the same as they had been. The screen that had been cut by the rapist was still an open wound, just as it had been, slit. We planted the flower seeds along the property line just next to the alley. Now, however, the house is transformed. The red brick 1920s duplex, a stately symmetrical structure, is no longer red. The side porch on both floors have been made into rooms, tastefully bricked in, as if they had always been that way. The house is now an elegant gray with black accents along the window panes. The yard is enclosed and there's a gray structure that seems to stand close by in the back as you look up at the house from the street. Once you go around the block and enter the back alley, it becomes clear that the gray structure is a large garage with an apartment above it. The garage stands where we used to park our cars. Towards the other side, close to where Miriam and I planted those seeds, there's now a fence. It encloses a tasteful small swimming pool, a patio, and a small swath of grass. This area is much smaller than the full grassy yard my landlady diligently mowed each summer. As I let myself look more closely at the back of the house, I realized that the back porch, that rickety structure, where I hooked up a mustard-colored washer and dryer I inherited that last year of graduate school, that same space where the rapist cut his way into my house is no longer there. Not a trace. This too is now bricked in. The back of the house is smooth. I realized that I realized as well that there's no longer a stairwell, a stairwell leading up to the second floor apartment where my landlady lived. This is more evidence that the house has been fully gutted and remade into a single family dwelling. I do not know what I expected to see, but it was not this. I do not know how to express my strange pleasure at seeing this house transformed. The house of pain became something else. And it, and it is beautiful. I am so unnerved by the transformation that later that night, I, back in our hotel room, I pop out of bed in the middle of the night in order to double check. I Google the address and check it against the address I wrote about in my first book. It's the same place. In Atlanta, 26 years after I was raped, I realized that it was almost a lifetime ago when I first moved into that house. I was 27 years old when I entered graduate school, 29 when I was raped. Now approaching 56, that's when I was writing this, I'm now older, I struggled to imagine how much time had passed. I thought of my first visit to Berlin in the spring of 2014. On that visit, I searched for signs of life before the wall came down in November 1989. In Atlanta, I thought again about contemporary Berlin and the changes in that city and its structures. Walls come down, new buildings go up, what was destroyed is remade, and writing this now, I struggle not to resort to cliches. The blood red bricks of my old house are gone. They've been, they've been covered over tastefully and I find the gray comforting, elegant, calming. It is as if one does not have to know, it's not as if one does not know that this house is made of brick, it's just different. Traces of what once was stand ne just next door. That large rambling structure is coming apart. It was sagging even then. But these days that house and yard bear the ravages of time, crumbling, neglected. I ran to the back door of that house to escape my attacker. And so I feel some abiding tenderness towards it. I had fantasized that night that the old Southern man, the powder familias of that house might run out, of his, run out with his shotgun and get the rapist. But even then he was frail, still looming, but no longer vital. The couple next door helped me as I struggled to get through to 911. I suspect that the house was a bequest to this couple's daughter, a woman about 10 years older than I am. I'm not sure she was well then, and I suspect that the house is in limbo, that she has not been able to attend to it, nor has she been able to sell it. This makes me sad. 
It's a reminder that things can play out so differently, thwarting our expectations and desires. The two houses are a study in contrast in the ravages of time and the healing power in this case of money, investment and renovation. Svetlana Boim wrote that the inability to return home is both a personal tragedy and an enabling force. These two houses capture this paradox. Both renewal and decay are possible. And although I have been lucky, things might have been different. Returning to these two houses to that time and this place, I'm humbled by how much has changed. Right now and still, I should say, I am hopeful. I see myself reflected in my former home. Although we are both older and grayer, we both stand tall. Like the ship Argo, we are still who and what we once were, even with all of these changes. And yet I need to say this once again, our stories could have been otherwise. There are no guarantees. We too might, en might have ended up like the house next door, which just might also, over time, become something else. Thank you, Laura, for sharing your story with us. I'd like to close with a Maori saying from New Zealand, where there is artistic excellence, there is human dignity. Laura, thank you for your creativity and helping so many of us experience a sense of human dignity through your art. <laughs>